the readings that this sermon supports are Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 18, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. Father God, as we gather around your word, we pray that you'll speak to each one of us individually. Father, for those for whom these things are, are well known, Lord, we pray that you'll speak to us afresh. Lord, revive us as we hear gospel truths. Lord, that we might be equipped and empowered to, to pass them on. And for those, Lord, for for whom what we will talk about today is new, we pray that you will draw them to you, Lord. Lord, that they might come to know you, come to put their trust in you, in Jesus alone. Amen. God has um, blessed us with a topical, connected Easter series. Sai started us off on Palm Sunday with the topic of reconciliation and how enemies become friends. On Monday, Thursday, Fergus expanded on Passover and specifically spoke about what we're doing when we take communion at the Lord's table. The following day, Good Friday, we looked at the Day of Atonement with a reference to how our consciences fit into the overall pattern of salvation and how sins are cleansed. Last Sunday, Sai spoke of redemption and how God rescues his people. Today, I have the topic of salvation and what the precious blood of Christ means to us. Before going on to that, for the sake of completion, we have Andy to look forward to next week and how God's righteous wrath is redirected. Propitiation. And finally, Stephen will talk about justification, how believers are pronounced righteous before God. Sacrifice. I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the Older Testament practice of ritually sacrificing animals, such as lambs or goats, to make up for the sins of human beings. The readers of the book of Hebrews were certainly familiar with it. It was a practice that they had left behind when they became followers of Christ. Last year, we did a series on Hebrews. Some of you might remember the context. The readers of the book of Hebrews were Jews who had accepted that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. They left the old ways of atonement through animal sacrifice behind and followed Jesus alone. But after a while, they suffered persecution for their faith in Christ. And for some of them, it became just too much. And they wavered between staying with Jesus or going back to the old ways. So the passage that we have um, from Hebrews uh, chapter 10 and verses 1 to 18 is directly addressing those who are thinking of drifting back to Judaism and animal sacrifices. Hear verse 1 again. But this time, this time, imagine that you are one of the waverers and that this is speaking directly to you. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, 
by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. In other words, like Fergus said a, a couple of weeks ago, the sacrificial system didn't, doesn't work. It can't cleanse anyone of their sin. A different sacrifice is needed. Jesus is often referred to as the Lamb of God because like a lamb which would traditionally have been sacrificed, he died to pay the price of our sin. He became the perfect sacrifice. But let's be careful not to downplay the place of animal sacrifice in the Older Testament. God didn't make a mistake. They were there to, well, they were there to provide a temporary covering of sin and to be a shadow of the perfect and complete sacrifice of Jesus. Animal sacrifice is an important theme because Hebrews chapter 9 tells us without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But animal sacrifices have ended because Jesus Christ was the ultimate and perfect sacrifice. John the Baptist recognized this when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Actually, though, I'm a bit of an animal lover. And I'm sometimes tempted to think, why? Why these poor animals? What have they done wrong? Well, I guess that's the point. They were blameless. They died in the place of the one who was guilty. Jesus did no wrong but willingly gave himself to die for the sins of mankind. Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself and died in our place. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, we can receive forgiveness. Oh, but this is so rudimentary, isn't it? If you've been in a Bible-believing church, even for only a short time, you will already be aware of, it, of, of everything that I've just said. It's been little more than an, than an evangelistic reminder but I make no apologies for that. If you want something deeper, let me recommend that you click onto the Gospel Coalition and an essay by um, Fred Zaspel, The Theology of Sacrifice. It's really good and not a difficult read. But if you don't know it, maybe you've not heard the Gospel, the good news before, then there's every chance that you're thinking, What's the big deal with blood? The phrase blood of Christ keeps cropping up in the Newer Testament. The most obvious is the reality that Jesus literally bled and died on the cross. But more significantly, that he bled and died for sinners. The blood of Christ has become the power to atone for an infinite number of sins committed by an infinite number of people throughout the ages. And all whose faith rests in that blood will be saved. Do you know, arguably, we overemphasize the cross of Christ. But it is through the blood of Christ that sinners are saved. Hence, the first part of this sermon, when I was laboring, the point about animal sacrifices being a shadow of that which was to come, Jesus. The blood of Christ is the foundation of the new covenant. On the night before he went to the cross, Jesus offered the cup of wine to his disciples and said, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The pouring of the wine in the cup symbolized the blood of Christ, which would be poured out for all who would ever believe in him. When he shed his blood on the cross, he did away with the old covenant requirement for the continual sacrifices of animals. While the blood of bulls and goats were a, a reminder of sin, 1 Peter 1.19 takes us to the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This precious blood paid in full the debt of sin that we owe to God. And we need no further sacrifices for sin. Jesus said, it is finished as he was dying. And he meant just that. The entire work of redemption was completed forever, having obtained eternal redemption for us, it says in Hebrews 9.12. Actually, you know, even if you're a mature Christian listening to this today, it's a good idea to remind ourselves from 1 Peter 18 and 19 that it's, it's the precious blood of Christ that gives us our worth. Peter demonstrates the value that God has placed on us by showing the price he paid for us. He didn't pay mere cash, you know, silver or gold. One commentator that I read stresses that he didn't pay temporary currency for an eternal transaction. He didn't pay temporary currency for an eternal transaction. We see in verse 9 that he paid for us with the blood of his own son. A currency of limitless value. We can't overestimate our worth in the Father's eyes. And what did Jesus redeem us from? Worthlessness. He didn't just save us from hell. He brought us out of, out of the futility of human existence. He brought us out of an empty, meaningless waste of time. Peter, in these two verses, is showing the great value that Christians carry in the eyes of God. It can be measured by the price that he's willing to pay in blood as the sinless, perfectly righteous son of God, the life of Jesus. His blood was of such great value that he became the final offering. No more animal sacrifices are needed to temporarily cover human sin. Instead, the Father has paid the ultimate price to redeem us, giving limitless value to lives that would otherwise have been futile and empty. You remember that old hymn by Lewis Jones, Power in the Blood? The lyrics, I guess, make a wonderful closing prayer. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you, O oh, evil, a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be whiter? Yes, brighter than snow. There's power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? Well, there's power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen.